Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present and share in a discussion with you today about the Family First Prevention Services Act. My name is Jeff Wade. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I'm a former child welfare caseworker and Title IV scholar, worked in uh, child welfare training and program evaluation for a little bit after direct practice before becoming a professor. So I'm hoping that this feels relevant to community practitioners and folks out in the field. And this is a presentation for the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare. I'd like to acknowledge them and their support of this work. So today what we're going to do is go over the Family First Prevention Services Act and really talk about its implications for practice in the field. And what we'll do is we'll contextualize the policy with some research and then conduct an analysis of the practice environment in which Family First Prevention Services Act will be implemented. We'll go over just a broad stroke overview of prevention science as a discipline and maltreatment prevention, what we know about child maltreatment in current research. Then we'll go over an analysis of the Family First Prevention Services Act. We'll walk you through each of the provisions, and then we'll do a practice analysis. So we'll talk about the practice context, implementation considerations, different challenges and opportunities that might come up for practitioners, supervisors, program managers out in the field, and then share some resources with you. Embedded in each of these slides are some reflections, so at different points in the presentation, there'll be some opportunities for you to think about the impact of this legislation on your own work personally. Really what we're about today is optimizing the potential of Family First to strengthen child welfare practice, and I'm going to call the Family First Prevention Services Act Family First. So we'll describe the provisions of the law, summarize key research and available resources to support its implementation, and then provide some considerations for reflection in local practice context. And the reason we're doing this is really, you know, knowledge is empowering, and the goal is to strengthen organizational capacity for proactivity. So making it so that caseworkers and supervisors and so on feel prepared to work with the law and implement it. And the hope really is that this is going to generate ideas to help optimize the potential to positively impact your work with families. So the Family First Prevention Services Act was originally passed in 2016 and then modified and passed again in 2018. And it was a bipartisan bill. And what it really does is it prioritizes maltreatment prevention, strengthens family preservation and foster care services, and promotes the relational permanence of youth in out-of-home care. So research indicates that successful implementation of policy actually unfolds in a number of steps. These include education, which is what today's presentation is really about, then organizational capacity building, so getting systems set up, redesigning or retooling systems to make change, then there's systems adaptation, so changes to how business is done, the procedures that are undertaken day-to-day -day in the operations of an organization. Then there's evaluation, looking over how things are going, process evaluation, and then outcome evaluation, what's the impact of the changes that we've made on our clients. And so today's really about education and capacity building organizations. Prevention science is sort of fundamental to thinking about the Family First Prevention Services Act. We're trying to prevent child maltreatment. We're trying to prevent system entry. And then when kids do come into the system, we're trying to minimize the negative impacts of system contact or out-of-home care on children. And so prevention science is a theoretical and practice framework, and it really spans the disciplines from biological sciences and epidemiology to social work and public health. So there's lots of, of different approaches one can take in a prevention science framework. And the specific research methods, I mean, really basic all the way to translational. So basic fundamental research, looking at associations or mechanisms, developing interventions, conducting observational research conducting experiments, finding what works, 
and then figuring out how to take what works and translate that or scale it up so that it's used in practice settings. And that's particularly relevant, I think, to today's presentation and this policy. So in a prevention science framework, risk and protective factors interact within what we call a bioecology. So the figure on the left-hand side here is the bioecological model from Yuri Brenner. And this image really shows a child nested in different systems. So if you think about the child as their own system, right? The biological, cognitive, emotional, social, and relational processes occurring within a child. But then that child is nested in a series of different systems. So the child is nested in the family, right? But the child's also nested in other microsystems like the classroom or peer groups or other settings where development is occurring. And then these microsystems interact. So families talk to schools, families talk to work, schools talk to work, different things like that. Those are considered mesosystems, which are embedded in these broader community contexts and then a broader political and social and economic environment. So risk and protection, this is the other image. Risk factors are conditions or processes that increase the likelihood of negative outcomes. So things that if they're present in the life of a child or the things that are happening might increase the likelihood of a child being maltreated or a negative outcome happening. Those are called risk factors. And then protective factors are things in the ecological environment that buffer or moderate risk. So the presence of protective factors reduce the likelihood of child maltreatment or other negative outcomes. The example here on this table is showing risk factors in red and protective factors in green. And you can think of it on that sort of teeter-totter. So like more protective factors are likely to lead to better outcomes. If protection outweighs risk, where we would think that that would hopefully lead to a better outcome. In the example here, if adolescent substance use, if teenagers starting to use drugs or alcohol or tobacco is an outcome that we want to avoid, then we need to attend to the risk and protective factors that are associated with adolescent substance use. So the example here, easy access, right? Like if it's easy to find and get drugs, that could be a risk factor. It might increase the likelihood of use. If a youth has a peer group that is using, that may increase the likelihood of a youth engaging in substance use. On the other hand, these protective factors like healthy family relationships or healthy parental involvement or school engagement, like these are things that we know from the research protect against substance use. So it's likely that risk and protective factors both exist that risk will be present and protection will be present in the life of a child, and that it's really the balance. What's the balance of risk and protection? And are we leaning more towards an outcome we want or an outcome we don't want? So there are three recognized forms of prevention. They're primary, secondary, and tertiary. And primary prevention, really focuses on avoiding the initial development of a problem or disease in healthy individuals. And this is achieved by boosting protective factors and limiting the potential for initial risk exposure. The general public is typically the focus of primary prevention strategies. And some examples include approaches like immunization and vaccination to prevent infection of viral disease. Other examples might be the development of health and safety standards for working on the job, like to prevent accidents at work. Secondary prevention really focuses on the early detection and treatment of risk to limit its potential over time. Targets of secondary prevention include subpopulations or specific people who, because of who they are, might be at increased risk of experiencing a particular problem. And prevention in a secondary context is really achieved through screening, early detection, and then intervention, so early intervention. Some examples could include routine developmental screening for children between birth and 36 months, looking for early signs of developmental delays or other things that might need intervention. Another example might be routine breast cancer screening for women over 40. Like it's not until you reach that age and you are that gender that you are at increased risk. So integrating screening at that stage would be considered secondary prevention. 
tertiary prevention really focuses on reducing the negative consequences of risk exposure. Populations are typically people who've already experienced a problem or disease, and most treatments or interventions that child welfare provide typically would fall within the realm of tertiary prevention. So these are kids and families where abuse has happened, and what you're really after is preventing future abuse and limiting the negative effects of the abuse the child's experience. So interventions and services to improve family functioning, improve children and family mental health, behavioral health, things like that. Nationally, year to year, the number of people who are referred to child welfare screened in changes. We'll see what COVID does to referrals and the data in 2020, but most recent estimates suggest about 4.4 million kids are referred to child welfare each year. A little over half of those referrals are screened in. About 3.4 million children are subjects of maltreatment reports. So the 4.3 million referrals, that includes duplicate counts, kids who've been referred more than once. But not actually many of the folks who are referred to child protection actually go on to become substantiated maltreatment victims. 656,000 youth of the 3.4 million children who were referred were actually substantiated victims. So there's a pretty large number of youth who are referred to child protection who agencies say, you know, maltreatment's not occurring or at least can't be substantiated. So I think there's some real implications for what we might be able to do for those folks, for the people who child welfare works with who, who aren't necessarily maltreating or who may need some support but haven't yet met the legal standard for substantiation. Most of what child protection deals with is neglect, followed by physical abuse. About 15% of substantiated victims were substantiated on more than one form of maltreatment. That's called polyvictimization. And the child fatality rate is actually increasing slightly. It was about 1,800 youth in the last reporting year. And then the slide here on the bottom for pathology, this is really from Felidi's work with the Adverse Childhood Experiences, the ACES study, but really thinking about like what happens when children are maltreated over the life course. So maltreatment can disrupt biological processes. Think about nervous system and trauma response to maltreatment. That can lead to social and emotional problems, which can lead to later adoption of risk behaviors, which over time, if we're thinking over the life course, can lead to disease and disability and early death. Significant body of empirical research has actually been devoted to identifying the key risk factors and pathological sequelae associated with the major forms of maltreatment. And no single risk factor predicts maltreatment, although evidence does suggest that cumulative exposure, so the more risk exposure a child or a family experiences, the greater likelihood of a maltreatment event occurring. Young children and youth with mental or physical disabilities are more vulnerable to maltreatment than other youth. Caregivers who are under high levels of stress, have a history of trauma themselves, either their own experiences with maltreatment or domestic violence, mental health, substance abuse challenges, inadequate knowledge of child development, inadequate knowledge of parenting, parent-child bonding and attachment challenges, criminal activity. These are things that can increase maltreatment risk. Family conditions include things like family structure, so low resource homes, single parent households with multiple children, Parenting attitudes and approaches, financial instability, intimate partner violence, these can contribute to child maltreatment. Things at the community level, if we're thinking about the child nested in these different systems, communities characterized by poverty, housing instability, criminal activity and community violence, lack of services and employment options, that can contribute to maltreatment. And then these broader sort of macro factors that can impact families, policies that reduce funding for social programs or critical safety nets for families, discriminatory practices that impair the ability of families to access resources. These are things that can contribute to maltreatment. So on the other hand, protective factors that moderate the maltreatment risk include individual or family capacity for resilience, Supportive family and strong social networks, stable and nurturing relationships, 
consistent child supervision and monitoring, positive parenting, family housing, economic stability, community cohesion. These are the things that are often the focus of prevention efforts. Protective factors in children. These are things like social emotional intelligence, social skills, healthy self-esteem, positive family and peer relationships. Protective factors for caregivers, things like healthy parent-child bonding, nurturing and attachment, knowledge of child development, parenting, presence of social support and strong coping skills, higher levels of household income, higher levels of educational attainment, communities characterized by social cohesion, presence of resources and infrastructure to effectively support children and families. So one question for you is to think about what types of risk and protective factors do you notice reappearing on the cases that you work with? What protective factors do you think are most useful to your treatment planning? There is a significant body of research looking at different ways to prevent maltreatment. And these target the different risk factors that we just discussed on the previous slide. Some of the research on primary maltreatment prevention programs look as though they really target caregivers of children. So home visiting, community programs, or combination models where there may be home visiting and also outpatient counseling or group parenting. Home visiting is a very common form of primary maltreatment prevention. These programs, like nurse home visiting programs, really engage new parents and are delivered by nurses, social workers, and therapists. These programs really focus on strengthening parenting skills, parent-child interactions, providing education to parents, helping them problem solve, providing emotional support, and then referring out to different resources in the community. Community-based primary prevention programs, a common one would be parenting classes. These would be aimed at the parents of typically non-infant children. The research evidence for primary prevention programs are mixed, although this California evidence-based clearinghouse identifies 11 programs as meeting their standards for research evidence. The Nurse Family Partnership and Safe Environment for Every Kid SEEK program are considered well-supported. And the Triple P Positive Parenting Program, which is an international parenting program, is rated as supported by the research evidence. If in your own community, you're thinking about working with new parents or parents of children before referral to child protection, 
there is a number of primary maltreatment prevention programs out there that communities can look at to consider strengthening their own prevention efforts. Secondary maltreatment prevention programs, these are the ones that are really targeting the families who have one or more maltreatment risk factors present. These are families that you might consider, quote unquote, at risk. These types of programs are typically engaging parents and children at the home and in the community and can be delivered by professionals or paraprofessionals. Secondary prevention programs focus on strengthening many of the same skill areas found in primary maltreatment prevention programs, but they engage parents and children to boost protection across specific risk factors. An example might be targeting substance abuse treatment for a family member or disruptive child behavior or coercive parenting practices, right? Like in a secondary prevention framework, we're actually trying to address things that we're seeing that we know if they're not addressed could lead to maltreatment, even though maltreatment's not happened yet. Tertiary programs, these are the ones child welfare probably most familiar with. These are targeting families who've already experienced maltreatment. So these are services like family preservation, foster care, adoption, post-adoption services. They target children, siblings, caregivers, kin, foster caregivers, they can be delivered individually or in combination. The focus is really in tertiary prevention, reducing risk and boosting protection in the specific areas that were associated with a maltreatment event. So what that might mean is a lot of what caseworkers do every day, right? Like developing plans around addressing parenting deficits or caregiving challenges, addressing mental illness or substance abuse, domestic violence, anger management boosting protection by providing caregiver training and support, placement stabilization, visitation, service coordination. The research evidence for tertiary prevention varies by the type of program, what they were targeting, and the methods they used, which is problematic for agencies and providers who want to provide the most evidence-based services to families who've experienced maltreatment. Fortunately, the Family First Prevention Services Act provides a framework and resources to help communities address this issue, and we'll discuss that in greater detail later in the presentation. The Family First Prevention Services Act of 2018 is a bill that amends multiple programs included in the Title 40 and Title 4B of the Social Security Act. Title IV-B is a program that has traditionally provided limited grants to states and tribes to provide family preservation and prevention services. Title IV-E is an annually appropriated program that provides funding to states and eligible programs to cover costs related to the delivery of foster care services to children, recruiting, training, retaining foster parents, developing and operating child welfare data systems. So this law, the Family First Prevention Services Act, contains eight provisions with implications for these different areas of practice, and these different funding streams. It basically opens up eligibility around these two funding structures to give states more flexibility in how they organize their prevention service infrastructure. The Family First Prevention Services Act has eight parts, and we're gonna go over each of these in detail. Each of these has a different implication for child welfare practice. The first is investing in prevention and family services. This allows states to use Title IV-E and IV-B funding to provide services to prevent foster care entry, and it clarifies eligible prevention activities and services. Previously, Use of 4B and 4E funds were restricted to once a child was removed from their home. But under this provision, agencies can now seek reimbursement for a selection of services they deliver before youth enter care. And youth are eligible for these services if they're considered at imminent risk of entering care unless these services are provided. Children who are at risk of adoption or guardianship dissolution Pregnant youth and minor aged children of parents who are in care are also eligible for these services. 
The types of services that are eligible for reimbursement include mental health, substance abuse treatment, home visiting, family navigation. The key thing is that they must meet the promising practice minimum standard for research evidence. So this act requires the services have an evidence base if they're going to be delivered to families. In order to claim funding for these services, agencies must develop a prevention plan, and this plan must detail the programs and services that are going to be delivered to the youth. They need to be trauma-informed. They need to have research evidence. To be considered promising or to have that research evidence standard, at least one study demonstrates improvement of an intervention above a comparison or control condition. And to be considered promising, that intervention has to have been shown to be effective over a comparison or control in one or multiple randomized trials. Services that are not trauma-informed or do not meet the minimum threshold of research evidence are ineligible for funding. This law also has some provisions around record keeping and the delivery of prevention services. The enhanced support under Title IV-B provision removes the time limit for reunification services, provides funding for regional partnership grants to strengthen substance abuse-afflicted families, and reduces barriers to interstate placement agreements. Under this provision, reunification services can be provided to caregivers and youth in out-of-home care, regardless of how long they've been in care, and extends family eligibility to receive these services for up to 15 months following reunification. So really expanding the length of time that a family can receive county services. The regional partnership grants require states to partner. So whoever is responsible for administering the substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant, partnering with child welfare, they can become eligible for these grants. Exceptions are provided to tribal entities who are not required to partner with state agencies. These grants are limited and awarded in two phases. The minimum grant award is $250,000 for two years and $1 million for multiple years. But this funding is contingent upon partnerships making reasonable progress and providing comprehensive reports related to the services they're providing. While there's an expansion of eligible families, there's also funding. So it's not one of those requests where they're asking you to do more, but then not providing additional resources to do that. So ensuring the necessity of placements not in a foster home limits federal funding for placement of youth into non-foster care placements. And it provides guidelines for the assessment and reporting of placements in non-foster home settings. It also provides guidelines to prevent inappropriate diagnosis and maintains current standards for background checks and clearances of anyone who's providing care to youth in out-of-home care. Support for non-foster care placements, things like shelter care, group homes, residential care. Under this law, funding is capped at 14 days, so two weeks, unless the setting meets one of the following four criteria. It's considered a qualified residential treatment program, it provides specialized services to pregnant or parenting youth. It provides supervised independent living services to transition age youth, or is a qualified family-based residential treatment center providing substance abuse services to caregivers of children who are also in their care. Settings are considered qualified residential treatment programs if their intervention model is trauma-informed and capable of addressing serious emotional and behavioral disturbances in children, is a licensed child care institution, and accredited by Health and Human Services. The provision maintains current standards or current definitions for child care institutions and family foster care. Exceptions to the cap on number of children living in a particular foster home are provided under this provision when parenting youth or siblings may otherwise be separated, or when the child has an established relationship to the caregiver, or the family is providing specialized care to children with severe disabilities. When children are placed into qualified residential treatment programs, additional case reviews, procedures are required. And that's what this ensuring necessity of placements out of foster home care provision is about. It's putting safeguards in place to make sure that counties are not putting kids into residential treatment centers that, sh that could be better served in typical foster care settings. What it requires is within 30 days of placement, a qualified individual must assess the suitability of that setting. 
So someone outside of the agency will come in and review and document how placement outside of foster care was the appropriate thing to do for the particular child. These qualified individuals are not employed by the Title IV-A agency or the residential treatment center providing the services. So an external reviewer is going to come in and look at any decision that's been made about placing a child in out-of-home care, and it needs to be justified. Agencies are also required to convene what are called family and permanency teams. And the purpose of these teams is to address progress of the use placement. And for youth who are over 18, they can select up to two members of that permanency team. Agencies are required to make good faith efforts to identify and contact family members and kin to see if they'd be willing to place a child. And the family and permanency teams weigh the benefits of placement in a qualified residential treatment program versus placement into foster care. And special documentation is required if that placement out of family foster care is longer than six months. So this provision also provides court improvement program funds to improve the administration of juvenile court services. To be eligible for these funds, each state must organize a training for their legal personnel and certify that they will not enact policies that effectively transfer children from child welfare to juvenile justice to bypass these standards for placement into non-family out-of-home care. The continuing support for child and family services provision clarifies funding for key child welfare programs. It extends discretionary funding for the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Child Welfare Services Program and the Promoting Safe and Stable Families Program and Court Improvement Program. And it makes competitive grants available to recruit and retain highly qualified foster families. It expands independent living service eligibility to children as young as 14, and it allows children to stay in care up until age 23. It helps support youth transition from foster care to adulthood through the delivery of programs and services like educational and vocational training, job readiness, mentoring, substance abuse prevention, and independent living skills. It requires states to make these services available to youth until 21 and provides funding to train child welfare staff and caregivers on youth development and developmentally appropriate practice. For youth, they're eligible to receive education and training vouchers to support attendance at institutions of higher education for up to five years, so long as they were in care after 14. So if you have children on your caseload at 14 or older, they should be eligible for an educational voucher to support higher education. States must also ensure that the youth who are in care have copies of their vital documents like birth certificates, social security cards, any other relevant health records uh, when they're leaving care. So the continuing incentives to promote adoption and legal permanence provision continues incentives for states to increase in permanency rates for kids who cannot be reunified in the amount of 43 million over five fiscal years. States are also required to reinvest any savings from increasing adoptions, although this provision delays some of the adoption eligibility criteria specified in previous legislation. There's a number of miscellaneous provisions in the legislation related to licensing of foster homes, preventing child fatalities, modifying language, and effective dates of previous legislation. It establishes a common set of standards for the licensing of foster homes and conditions under which those standards can be waived. It also revises record keeping requirements for child fatalities, requires cross disciplinary partnerships, prevent child fatalities through a fatality prevention plan. There's two technical corrections in the law requiring Health and Human Services to develop regulations related to the types of information child welfare agencies collect and share with federal and state partners. And the second amends Title IV-B to require states to articulate plans to address the developmental needs of all children under age five who could be eligible for prevention services under this law.
So this image really kind of illustrates the continuum of child welfare services. On the far left-hand side would be what's going on in the community before children are referred to child protection, and that up to the point of the initial call to a child welfare hotline. The things that are going on prior to that contact or prior to system action, any intervention or service that's going on outside of child welfare involvement would be considered primary prevention. Then secondary prevention, this is really, you know, investigation, family preservation, service delivery in situations where maltreatment's not occurred, but we're thinking there's risk factors here that need to be addressed. And then tertiary prevention, really, you know, we've established that maltreatment's happened and we're intervening and we're going to treat these risk factors to prevent future maltreatment, but also to address the consequences of the maltreatment that the child's already been exposed to. So the law provides a number of opportunities for primary prevention. The ones that they detail are state plans to provide developmentally informed services, requires collaboration across child serving systems and the coordination of prevention services. This is supported through congressional allocations, block grants, competitive grants, and infrastructure to support continuing education and training. So there's a lot of stuff that can be done just in terms of service coordination and getting agencies within states and counties to talk to each other. There's funding to get some of those services organized and arranged so that they can be deployed before maltreatment's occurring. There's some opportunities for secondary prevention. I think that what this law really does is allows practitioners to engage families from a prevention perspective by opening the option to deliver services before maltreatment's occurring, but provides a chance to address some of the concerns that caregivers have and hopefully engage with services before it's required. But this requires practitioners to have an understanding of the types of challenges that families who engage with involuntary services like child protection might come with. It also increases the use of evidence-based practices. So um, when counties are delivering services to families where maltreatment suspected or it's occurred, there's a requirement in this law that the services be evidence-based. We'll talk in another slide or two about the implications of that, but hopefully what that would lead to is services that are tailored to the maltreatment risks, specifically to the things that we know increase likelihood of maltreatment. We would hope that it would lead to better service consistency and expectancy. The downsides would be fewer options. There are plenty of evidence-based practices, but they're not available everywhere. And depending on where you might practice, there could be delays and referrals and so on. So the opportunities for tertiary prevention. It loosens guardianship restrictions and restricts the use of residential care. So it makes it easier to place kids in family homes, and it makes it harder to place them in residential facilities. It requires developmentally informed and specialized services, and it provides funding to train caseworkers, caregivers, and service providers on these concepts. I think probably the most palpable implication of this provision for direct practice is loosening restrictions on kith and kinship placements and making placing youth in non-family foster homes more difficult. So given what we've talked about, I'd like you to take a few moments to think about how might Family First provide your community with opportunities to practice differently. And what do you think might be some of the major challenges that will make changing practice difficult for you and your organization?
So now we'll think about what are the different things that you and your practice context might be important to consider when implementing this law. And the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, this image here on the right-hand side, are the different domains or areas that you'll want to be thinking about as you're gearing up to implement this law. These include the policy or intervention characteristics, the environment in which this policy is going to be enacted, the organization, so the external environment, meaning the community, the internal setting, meaning the organ organization, characteristics of the employee or the individual, and then the process by which all of this gets implemented. So some factors, and then this is not going to be an exhaustive list, but some of the things that are important to consider related to the policy itself are the perceived relevance of the policy to practice and the strength and quality of the law itself, but also the evidence used to craft it, the relative advantages of change versus keeping things the same, and the complexity of the policy, the design quality and cost. These are things that are important to consider. The outer setting. So the external environment, these are things like the needs of the clients or the needs of families in your community. Every community is different. And while there's some common risk factors for maltreatment, the things that specific communities are experiencing, that may vary, right? I think about like methamphetamine or opioid addiction, right? Like that may be more likely in some areas than others or stable housing or community violence. Like there's variance in those types of things depending on where you are. So the setting in which you're practicing, what are the needs of the community? What are the things that are going on? What are the resources? What are the services that are available? How many services are available? What's the, the quality and competency of those services? The inner setting is really the structural characteristics of the agency, the nature and quality of the organizational networks, level of collaboration in an organization, but also how an agency collaborates with its external partners, the organizational climate and culture, the perceived compatibility of the policy to the organization's values, and the relative priority of implementing this versus all the other things that people need to do. And the individual factors, this is probably the most relevant to you as the reader or listener today, is what are the knowledge and beliefs that you have about the policy and program, the feelings of self-efficacy, the ability to achieve these goals, level of motivation or enthusiasm to engage with the policy, and how does this align with the organization's values and motivations? So policy could be crafted that's very meaningful and relevant and provides lots of supports. But if people don't see the value in it, if they don't see its congruence with their own values or practice orientation, that will be problematic. And then there is the implementation process itself. So how do all these things unfold? And how do people work together to make these things happen? So for your reflection, I'd like you to think about what do you think are the primary barriers to successful implementation of Family First in your own community and practice setting? And what do you think your community or organization needs most to be successful in implementing these practice changes?
So chances are you thought about some of these things, like some barriers to implementation might be the complexity of risk. How serious are the different types of problems that are coming to the attention of your agency? How willing is the family or the child to engage in prevention services and to work with you before non-voluntary interventions required? How relevant are the services that are available to the needs that your families are experiencing? How relevant are the services that are available in your community to what Family First is willing to fund? Are the services that are being provided in the community evidence-based and are they evidence-based in a way that Family First requires for them to be funded? Other issues, you know, these long, in child welfare, like high caseloads, turnover, resource constraints. These are some of the organizational conditions that practitioners in child welfare have to deal with every day. And it can make it difficult to innovate or change practice. That said, there's a number of facilitators that can make this easier. The acceptability of Family First to your own practice, to your agency, the fit of what Family First is trying to do by opening service eligibility, limiting restrictive placements, delivering evidence-based services. How well does that fit to the needs of the families in your community? Are you motivated and excited about this? Or does this feel like one more thing that you have to do? And then what kinds of organizational supports are in place to help implement? And what are the impacts? If these changes are required, but you don't see a benefit, that can be difficult. So seeing positive change, seeing reductions in caseloads, reductions in maltreatment or maltreatment recurrence, these are the types of things that typically accelerate or support implementation of laws like Family First. Fortunately, multiple resources have been developed to support implementation of this legislation. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides guidance in the form of technical bulletins which detail the interpretation of the law. The Title IV Prevention Services Clearinghouse will provide summary ratings of research evidence for all the different types of services that families involved with child welfare might receive. The Handbook of Standards and Procedures details the different criteria and measures used to rate the evidence of available programs. And there's also a number of other evidence-based clearinghouses, or you can look for information on what might work for the families you're serving, and those are here. Blueprints, CEBC, Home Visiting Evidence of Effectiveness, Teen Pregnancy and Prevention Evidence Review. You can go to these clearinghouses, you can go to the Title IV e clearinghouse or these other evidence-based clearinghouses to get a sense of what interventions are out there that might be relevant to the problems you're working with and how they work, how effective are they. And there's nonpartisan and advocacy groups, Child Welfare League of America, First Focus, University agency partnerships are a huge resource to child welfare systems that can provide ongoing training, guidance, and support really to optimize the potential of the law to improve practice. So I want to thank you for watching this brief overview of the Family First Prevention Services Act. I hope that it's helpful to you in your thinking about this law and how it might impact your practice and gives you some ideas moving forward. Thank you so much.